Okay, Acts chapter 5 is a long chapter. But we'll get through it because it's, a, it's narrative. There's not a whole lot of deep theology except this first part, which we've got to talk about because it's, it's weird. And you can read all the commentaries and all the wise people that have talked about it and still go, what is this actually about? I mean, is it what it says? It's, I find it a hard story to read. So Acts chapter 5. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost, and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whiles it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all of them that heard these things. And the young men arose and wound him up and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said to her, unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straight away at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at the least, the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came, and they that were with him, and called the council together, and all the senate of the children of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety, and the keepers standing without before the doors, but when we had opened, we found no man within. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not straightly command you that thou should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hung on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so also in the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of law, had in reputation all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space, and said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do is touching these men. For before these days rose up Thaddeus, boasting himself 
to be somebody to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain and all as many as obeyed him were centered and brought to naught. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew away much people after him, he also he also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispirited. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men, and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every hour, in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Christ Jesus. Okay, King James is a little weird. The grammar is a little weird. Does it have, does it, ESV have that section that talked about... And they were all with one in cord in Solomon's porch. Is that in our translation? Yes. Okay. Call it a cord code, but... Yeah, because it's, uh, it's bracketed in the King James. Or parentheses. Parenthesized? Parentheses. Okay, so I'll ask the same thing I asked my confirmation class. So you notice like two weird things in this story? Or mm-hmm. things that, two strange things in this story, in this chapter? Well, the husband and wife together on the spot mm-hmm. because they uh, said something that was not honest. Right, so that seemed a little harsh, right? Smitey. This is awful smitey. It's like Old Testament God. Smitey. So that confirmation class, but yeah, they got what they deserved. It's like, wow! <laughs> okay. But it set the stage. Yeah, so we're going to talk about that more. And what was the other thing? It's because it's one of my favorite little verses in the Bible. That was kind of strange. And it goes right... In the jail, it was uh, that an angel of the Lord came in the night and released all of the prisoners. I mean, that's amazing. It's a miracle, but I didn't find it strange because that's happened before. Yes, it has. But uh, the Sanhedrin didn't uh, expect it. Yep. Neither did anyone else. Yeah, so we have, and, it, and it went right on by the prison guard. He was still at the door. Right. And there's like, morning. what happened? Well, they were like Jesus. They went back to the temple. Mm-hmm. The yeah, exactly. The thing that I find strange, and, and it's a neat little part that it goes back, because it's like almost like a little interlude between, okay, here's the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Here's the story of Peter and John in jail. And in between, well, now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem, and more than ever, believers were added, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on them. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Peter's shadow healed people. Pretty cool. Did it really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right? Yeah, that's right from context that Peter... They put them so Peter, even Peter's shadow would touch them because they'd be healed because they had faith, right? Because they believed. Even if Peter's shadow touches us, this is a man of God. He's talking about Christ Jesus resurrected for the forgiveness of sins. I believe that. If his shadow touches me, I'm going to be good. And they were. It's like the woman that touched the hem of his Mm -hmm. garment. Exactly. And we'll see a lot of parallels as we go through Acts. There's going to be parallels of what the apostles' acts were, what Jesus' acts were. So yeah, I would say that's the parallel. So let's go to the hard part, Ananias and Sapphira. Okay, so what did they do? Literally, what, what, was, what did they, they do? They sold land. Okay, they sold land, and then what did they do? They lied about how much they got for it. I mean, they, they kept some of it for they themselves it. and gave the rest, but claimed that what they gave was the whole. Right, and that's why they made a point talking about Barnabas, who was a Jewish convert, right? He was a Jewish convert, a Levite, sold a field and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Boom. So Ananias and Sapphira sold the land, kept part of the money, 
and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Did they say? Did they actually say, we sold it for such and such and this is what we gave it? Did Ananias say that? It doesn't, it doesn't say that no. he did. No, it doesn't say Ananias did that. Did Sapphira say that? No. Yes, she did. Yes, she did. Yes, she did. Yes. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. So Anna, I, Ananias lied differently, but he, but still he... Lies a lie. Lies a lie. Well, but but my, my Bible says, with his wife's full knowledge... Now, this is just verse number two. Mm -hmm. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Right. Right. But it's not saying he claimed when he laid it at their feet that it was all of it. Right. If, at, it was inferred. Ananias, yeah, Ananias never said he gave all of it. But, but it was inferred. In, it, it is inferred. Peter, Peter seems to understand that that's what happened. Yeah, Peter saw into his heart and saw his deception. And, of course, then it's contrasted with Barnabas giving all the proceeds. So was it a sin for Ananias to keep back part of the money for himself? No. No, it was not. Like Peter said, while it remained unsold, the land was yours. After it was sold, you could dispose of it as you wished. But why have you contrived this deed in your heart? So what was Ananias and Sapphira's sin? Well, other than the lie, what was Ananias' sin? Greed? No. Because he kept? Part of the money? No, that was within his right. It was within his okay, rights so to... so it was to... because he lied? No. It's not the lie. He didn't actually lie. Okay. Peter accused him, and then he died, but he didn't actually lie about... Uh, I mean, he was deceitful in his heart, but what was their actual sin? It was against the Holy Spirit. The hypocrisy of... Mm -hmm. But this is all secret. This is all in his heart. Peter saw into his heart. He was given this special ability to see into another man's heart. He lied to God instead of man. I mean, <clears throat> did he lie? Is it because he planned it? Getting there. So what? And when it all boils down, what was he after? He wanted the recognition, as if he was like Barnabas. There you go. <coughs> he wanted the recognition. Oh, it's like, look, here's Barnabas, right? He sold he sold this field, and he, boom, he laid all the money there. And and there was also, go back further. Now the full number of this is a few verses back when we went at not you know the last time we met. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to any as any had need. And then gives the exist specific example of Barnabas selling a field, uh, because then Ananias and Sapphira also sell a field. So what's the, what's the overall... Synopsis then. So his sin was vanity. Okay. Right? So and not, was, deceit, not deceit. Vanity, but the, not the deceit. The deceit fed the vanity. The, de the deceit came from his vanity, from his avarice. Right? He wanted that recognition. He wants to be recognized. It wasn't good enough that, okay, all the, all the folks are laying the money out and we're all going to share it, and that's pretty cool. And well, we want to do that, but we want to keep a little something for ourselves. But we want the recognition of being that selfless. So Ananias' sin was avarice. Or or vanity, greed, not greed ish, but the, the avarice more of the hunger for that recognition. You know, you want to be uh, counted as, you know, important. Because if you sell if you sell something and you give it all away, you know, people like that. You know, why do rich people give away lots of money? Because people like that rich people give away lots of money and help People are less fortunate, but they're also still rich, right? But there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with being rich. You know, do they do it out of the goodness of their heart, or they do it for a tax break 
different discussion. What made Peter ask the question in the first place? That's what makes this story so hard. Because, yeah, okay. So they were looking for that recognition, and yeah, they probably would have got it. But So it, it is hypocrisy. It is hypocrisy to a degree. But yeah, what made Peter ask the question? That's the question. Really, that's the question. Well, he knew. Like Jesus would know. He knew. Mm -hmm. well, spirit, uh, and he called him out on it. Because if he hadn't, he probably would have thought maybe that he got away with it. And like I said, I like to look for when reading Acts because we're usually more f familiar with Luke or the Gospels. Look for it, but it, particularly with Luke, look for parallels. But look for parallels in the Gospels. So what's the parallel in the Gospels? Who would be the person that was greedy, that set him on a bad path? Keeping in mind that Peter asked the question, and this should help, why has Satan filled your heart? Judas. Judas, good. So what does it say? It says it in Luke. I don't know if it says it in... I believe it's in Luke, the Lucan account of the Last Supper, where it said, yeah, it's John's account. John's account, you know, he look, it's, it's the one who dips with me in the dish, and then he looks at Judas and says, what you must do, do quickly. Luke's account, it actually says, and the devil entered into him. And so he is, he is the uh, parallel. That doesn't mean you get to say the devil made him do it. But keeping in mind, too, that this is uh, right after Pentecost, mm -hmm. when being being filled with the Spirit at that point uh, to do what they needed to be done. Right. So it wasn't just a random question that he had that indwelling power, knowledge. Yeah, and I don't. Correct me if I'm wrong as we go along, but I think this is the only time we see something like this, where you see one of the apostles is able to look into the heart of another man. I think this is a unique event, uh, which is another thing that makes it so hard. It's like, why? You don't think that they could do that could all they the time? It they, just wasn't written down for our knowledge? Very likely. Okay. Very likely. I mean, we do know the <laughs> apostles could do things no one else could do, because... They're eyewitnesses to the resurrection, so they can do the things Jesus did, so they can say, hey, they say they saw Jesus raised from the dead, and these guys can do the stuff we saw Jesus do, so they must be telling the truth. Uh, and then once the gospel promulgated a little further out into the world, and the apostles passed on, the next generation could not do these things, right? We have no, we have tons and tons of, of uh, writings from that first generation, the, the, we call them the apostolic fathers, the earliest church fathers after the apostles. We have tons of their writing, and there's no stories like that. So this was pure, the apostles had these powers, abilities, uh, special dose of the Holy Spirit, whatever you want to call it. And I think this is the only time we see this where a man can look into another man's heart and discern the truth. They probably shocked themselves sometimes with... Probably, they probably... They had things that would come out of their mouth that didn't form up here, it just came out. Uh, yeah, that happens on Sunday mornings too. <laughs> it really does. Awesome. It's like every now and then you're just like, I really wish I remembered what I just said because I don't know where that came from. I mean, I know where it came from, but it's like, hey, that was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, once in a while. So yeah, yeah, the Holy Spirit absolutely is living and active uh, through everyone in the office of the ministry for sure. Uh, but the, like this is a special, like, wow. I don't know if I'd want that power to be able to like just look at somebody and know what they're thinking. Like, ugh, what a burden that would be. No, what do you do with that? that? Happened. I mean, it might have just been that momentary. It might have been. Well, like I said, it's the only time it's recorded. Mm -hmm. So maybe they could do it when necessary. Maybe it was done here to Good prove point. a point. But then let's talk about the point now. Uh, does that sound like in the New Testament God, the God of the New Covenant? Was that a little harsh? I mean, it was 
with an eye opener. Yeah. How open do we know that the things happen? They would say, I was just thinking about that. Or I was just going to do that. Not that makes us, you know, but I think that we as now have that same spirit with certain people about certain things at certain times. Not that it's spooky, but an example, <laughs> scared her to death, but a friend of mine, well, we were very close. And we were going from <clears throat> Geneva to Madison. And I was driving. And I normally would have gone down Clay Street to 45 to 84. And I just, which I did that, I, I mean to 90. But I went down over 90, went to 84 to go to Geneva. And we were talking about some of anything, and all of a sudden, out of my mouth, it didn't form up here, I said, I came down 84 because I didn't feel like I wanted to drive 60 miles an hour. And she was just going to ask me why I was doing that, but she didn't want to because she's bipolar and she's always afraid she's going to hurt somebody's feelings. And that question was in her mind at the time, but didn't want to ask me. And we were, it had nothing to do with anything, it's just, I just said it. And I think that happens to us, especially the people that we care about a lot. You know them, and you know, just at certain times. They yeah, you can complete out. each other's thoughts. I mean, right? I mean, did you and George ever do that? <laughs> right? <laughs> we do that. We do that. It's scary, and sometimes it's just silly. But yeah, that does happen. Okay, so a point is being taught. I mean, it still seems like, wow, that's a little extreme, though. It's like God struck him dead. Didn't have a chance to repent. Right. And then his, his wife had a chance to repent. Yeah, that she did. And she did not. But she, she, made it, but she made it worse. She didn't know. She didn't know what had happened. Did it matter? Did it matter? No, it didn't. It's like, okay. But then, you know, when, at the very beginning, it says that uh, Ananias had his wife's full knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so they were fully they were in cahoots. They, they were fully in cahoots. On that. Yeah. Okay, so we have a married couple fully in cahoots, and we have the influence of Satan. Where have we seen that before? Aren't there was a question? So we have a married couple fully in cahoots in, in a sin, mm -hmm. and the devil influencing them. Yeah, Where have we yeah. seen that before? Genesis chapter three. All right, the fall. Mm -hmm. All right, so. This is exact, this is absolutely a parallel of that. So they are like Adam and Eve in paradise because this is the early church. I mean, why else did they twice, they've mentioned to us. It's like, man, where is it back? Chapter two, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of the bread and prayers and awe came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were being done. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And daily they were together and praying. And then you have in chapter 4. Now the full number of those who believe were of one heart and one soul. We already read that part. All right, so twice, very explicitly, Luke has written that down. And now we have the story of Man and a woman, married man and woman who fell into sin by the devil's influence and it caused them to die. What else did it? What happened to the world when sin entered the world? People died, right? We die. Animals died because where the skins come to cover from them, to cover them their nakedness. God ripped the skins off those animals. I have to sneeze. I don't have to sneeze. Ugh. So God tore the skins off these animals probably in front of them because they had to learn how to do it themselves now, right? So death entered the world, not just for men, but for all living things, right? And then what happens? Well, now you have disunity. Now you have brother killing brother. You have everything that followed in this broken world. So now here, the new covenant, right? And everybody's getting along, and everybody's of one doctrine. Wouldn't that have been nice? Everybody's of one doctrine, one faith, and they're having everything together communally, and nobody has want, nobody has lack, but two people, 
wanted to be better than everybody else. They wanted recognition, and they wanted to do it by deceit. And so they ruined even the early church. It's still sin is there. It's a parallel, I think. That's why this story is here. It's like, yeah, Jesus is making all things new in the new covenant, but they're not new yet. This is another one of those now and not yet moments. You have the forgiveness of sins in Christ Jesus now, but the full benefit of that is not yet, not till the world to come. This world is still broken. Church started out strong, and I mean, it exploded like for, it should never have survived logically. You know, it should never have made it through the Roman Empire. But it did, because God was in control. But here you have everything starting out. Everybody is doing what Christians are supposed to do, but it only takes one to disrupt everything. And that's what happened. And I think that's why this story is here. And like even the study, like the study notes in the Lutheran study Bible, study notes in other Bibles I looked at, like the Roman Catholic one is awful. I mean, there's like two little notes that don't really tell you anything. Because they're not really addressing any of this. So just from reading all the commentaries, and they don't really touch it, you know. Because everybody asks, that they come without actually asking the question to the reader, don't you think this was a little over the top for God to do this? Didn't Jesus die for that sin? I mean, did the sin, was the sin of Ananias and Sapphira paid for on the cross? Oh, yes. Yeah, if they were repentant of it. And they had a chance. I mean, they had a chance. Now, are Ananias and Sapphira in hell? No, I don't think so. I would have never even heard anybody suggest it. But so it's like, hey, they got to go home early. That's kind of all right when you start taking a look around some days. Like, that's not a bad thing. Death is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. So this is a hard this is a hard passage for a lot of people to read because then then they want to turn it because we're all legal we're all Pharisees at heart we all want to number one be God because it's the original sins I want to be like God uh, so if I'm like God I got to have it my way so I'm going to twist it and go well you know you know this is a message about you know giving you know and being honest in your giving you know don't lie to yourself you need to tithe they turn it into a tithing thing which whatever. Tithing is actually part of the Old Covenant ceremony or uh, moral law that's not part of the Ten Commandments. But anyway, um, that wasn't the point. But tried, people want to focus on that, that it was, oh, they kept part of the money. I'm like, no. Well, no, they lied about it. Well, yeah, but still not getting to the root. The root was, you know, everything was good and they thought they could make it better. They thought that they could be better than everybody else. And that's what, and that once that enters the church, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to spread, right? I think that's human nature. Right, it is. It is human. It's fallen human nature. You know, so is this the first time it happened? Is this the only one that's recorded? Maybe it's the first time it happened. I mean, it would probably be pretty notorious. That's like, hey, did you see what happened? What happened? What happened? They, they gave money and they're dead. Was he, did he do it that publicly where people actually knew what he said to him? I mean, is all the details public? I don't know. I think people speculate a lot about this. So we only have the words that were recorded. Yeah, so. Yeah, I think that's why, why that story is here for no other reason, because it, because in one in one way, it does seem unfair. It's like, that was a harsh punishment. I mean, punish them. Punish them in the civil, civil realm. You know, hey, it's like stealing, you know. But, but it wasn't a public skin because they didn't sin publicly. They just told Peter. So it's, it's complicated. Maybe I'm making it harder than it needs to be. But it just seems like, it seems like we should have tr- trouble with it. We don't because we understand, yeah, this is just like the fall. This is just showing human nature, like you said. Well, there was one time when the earth opened up and swallowed a whole family. Yeah, there was that. And and there was the guy that that stuck their hand out to keep the ark from stumbling, even though it was floating. But, you know, and then there's the fellows that offered an unasked-for sacrifice. 
un, unasked for uh, fire in the temple and God killed them. But it's all, that's Old Testament God. God did those things to set those people apart from the rest of the world because their gods were dead gods. They didn't actually do stuff. God, our God does stuff. Once Jesus came, didn't have to do that anymore. So this is harking back to those Old Testament type of things. It's a little hard to read. But I think that's why it's there. Now, you guys talk, because, like I said, this is a hard, I think it's a hard story, and the, the more you read, the less anybody actually comes out and says what it's about. You know, like there's, like the notes here, uh, the Holy Spirit, source of this power, is himself fully God, equal to the Father and Son. St. Ambrose says, Peter teaches that the same is the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of the Lord. Ambrose, again, the Spirit of the Lord is the very Spirit of God. The power manifested in the apostolic ministry of the church, if abused, brings serious consequences. And Ananias' love of riches set him on Judas's accursed path. That's the only useful nugget out of all those notes. Yeah, we know we know the Holy Spirit is fully God. You know, we get that. He's working through the power of the Holy Spirit. So Ananias' love of riches set him on Judas' path. But that still doesn't get to it. It wasn't just about the money. Uh, grievous sin threatens to extinguish spiritual life. Here it brings about bodily death also. Right? Ananias' death is a divine chastisement understood in light of the biblical witness to God's holiness and then it gives you a whole bunch of Old Testament references and also Hebrews uh, passages which, a passage in Hebrews 12 which is pointing to those same stories. Uh, my, my explanation, it also points out that this is the first time that sin entered the church. And right. that it it's pointing out that uh, the church needs to be careful mm -hmm. uh, that uh, sin does not overtake it. Yeah. It serves as a really, really good example. <clears throat> yep. Yeah, so how long is this after, exactly after Pentecost? We don't really know, I don't think. Maybe we can't leave it there might be enough dates to figure out like how long after Pentecost this is, but I mean that's not the point. But the point is, like you said, the church was the church was doing what God wanted, and then someone has to listen to the devil going, "Wouldn't it be nice if you were like you know like the head deacon or something, whatever? If Throw you do this, down off the temple, and yeah, all this can be yours, right?" I was like, "Did God really say?" Because the devil, and you can't say the devil made you do it because the devil only tells you what you want to hear. It's real good about that. He doesn't, I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't make you work that hard. He doesn't make you think that hard. It's like, oh, you got to wrestle with the devil. The devil tells you exactly what you want to hear. Always. You might not realize that's what you really want, but he knows. It's like, yeah, in your heart, that's what you really want, isn't it? Okay. And then the note about Peter's shadow, it just says, God's work through Peter is amazing. Thank you for that substantive nugget of wisdom. Okay, so we, we have this apostolic era where, where great signs and wonders, just like they're talking about the apostles, just like Luke talked about Jesus. So they're doing, they're doing this important stuff. So now we have the high priest. Now we're in verse 17. The high priest rose up and all who were with him. But this is all the Sadducees, not the Pharisees, for change. So we're still with the Sadducees. With the, the people that don't believe in the resurrection. People that don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. Once you're dead, you're dead. Why? Really? You might as well not believe in God. What? If this is all, all the life there is, then it's every man for himself. And whoever dies with the most wins because that's all there is. So I never really understood the Sadducee party. But. So they're all jealous. Why are they jealous? Because the people are following the apostles and not them. Yeah, so this little movement's growing, right? And it's alarming. Because, like, what does every pastor hate? And they all hate to see the church down the road getting bigger. <laughs> and like, why is our church staying the same and the church down the road's getting bigger? What are they doing that we're not? 
So they're jealous because the people are listening to the apostles and not listening to them. And what happens to you when the people are not listening to you? Your power is diminished. It's always about power, right? For them, it's about power. Maybe for some of them it was about service, but they like their high position, as Jesus always pointed out to us. Uh, and again, reinforcing that idea of hypocrisy. You know, with Ananias, with Sapphira, Jesus always pointed out the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. All right, so they arrested them and put them in prison, but during the night the angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out. And said, you know, go... Go stand in the temple and speak to everybody the words of this life. Is everybody, is life capitalized in your Bibles by chance? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? So this life, capital L. So the way, this life of the way, capital W. The way, the truth. Well, the, the, that's just what they call the early Christians, just call themselves followers of the way. Okay. Yeah. This one is, is lower. Is it what? Lowercase? It's lowercase. Yeah, it's a, it's a translation the board of translation makes a decision, but the, the, this uh, little document called the Didache, uh, which is also called the Teaching of the Twelve Apostles, it was discovered you know, a few hundred years ago. Um, if it had been discovered or known about way back when, it might even be in the Bible because you can't find anything in it that's not elsewhere in the Bible. Uh, tradition has that each of the Twelve Apostles wrote part of it. There's no evidence for that. But it was lost for thousand, you know, what was it, over 1,200 years, 15, 16, like 1,700 years, I want to say, 1,600 years. I don't remember. i got to find out when it was. Maybe it was discovered before the Reformation. i got to double-check. But this document was lost, and only one copy was found, and they've since found others. Uh, and right at the beginning, the very first verse of the Didache, it says the teaching of the 12 apostles, there are two ways, one of life and one of death. And that's a very much the way uh, a people of a Hebraic background would write. And that's written, it's written in Greek. Uh, but you always have the, the this or the that. That's a very Hebraic way of writing. So you have the way, followers of the way of life, capital O. Um, and so then the apostles are freed from jail and they go into the temple exactly where they've been told not to go and keep teaching. And then the high priest came and those that were with them now they call together the council, the senate of the people of Israel, and they sent to the prison to have them brought, but, oh, jailbreak. Not in the prison. Prison's locked. Guards are standing guard to an empty prison. And they look in, there's nobody there. So they bring the captain and the temple guards. So the captain and the temple guards, those are the guys that arrested Jesus in the garden, right? Along with the, uh, the Roman cohort that they sent with them. Same guys. So they weren't there. And like, where'd they go? And then, well, hey, they're in the temple teaching. Like, hmm. So then the captain and the officers, they all go there, but they don't go. They, they grabbed the apostles and brought them to the chief priests and these guys. But they didn't do it by force because, yeah, what's going on? Like, you know, we're afraid of the people, just like they tried to arrest, they wanted to arrest Jesus, but they were afraid of the people. So then they brought him, put him in front of the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, we told you not to do this, yet you're doing it. And you, are, you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. What man's blood? Jesus. Jesus' blood, right. So you filled Jerusalem, filled Jerusalem with your teaching, because the rabbis never exaggerated ever when they say something. They fill Jerusalem. Well, they are filled Jerusalem. They're growing. This is a big movement. And you intend to bring this, this man's blood on us, meaning this man's blood guilt on us. Guilty conscience? Much? Yes. Exactly. So it's like, yeah, and they're going to go, because yeah. they keep saying, you know, this Jesus whom you crucified, they also said that to the regular people. It's like, yeah, these are the guys that had him put to death. All right. So like, hey, we told you not to do this, and you're trying to get us in trouble with the people. You're trying to get us killed. But Peter answered, and the apostles answered, we have to obey God rather than men. It is pretty hard to argue with that. 
So here is a part of the Augsburg Confessions, Article 16. says, it is necessary for Christians to be obedient to their rulers and laws. The only exception is when they are commanded to sin. And this is a good proof text verse for that. It's like, we told you not to do this. Yeah, but we got to obey God rather than men. He said, go teach this stuff. Right? The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at the right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we're witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit who God has given to those who obey him. So, yeah. That's a pretty clear confession. Then in a book by John Huss called The Church, he said, you ever, everybody know who John Huss is? So John Huss is the fellow about 100 years before Martin Luther who started preaching, yeah, the church needs to reform and since Reformation since weekend. Uh, John Huss was saying, you know, the church needs to be reformed. You're doing things that are not in the Bible. We need to do what's in the Bible. And they you know, burned him at the stake for his efforts. Uh, so he was like one of the Luthers that came before Luther. Luther wasn't the first guy to come up with all this stuff. Uh, when the one was Huss was the one that they burned him at the stake, buried his bones, and then later they dug up his bones and burned him again and threw him into the river. Was that they threw, or was that? I think. I think, I think that was Huss, and they threw his. Then they threw the ashes of his bones after they dug him up and desecrated his grave. They burned him again, ground him up, and threw him in the in the river, so that nobody could come and venerate, venerate him as a saint. They, did, they almost did that to Luther, too. They said, yeah, we can't have him buried here in the church because people are going to you know, make a saint out of him. It's like, yeah, you know, his followers were kind of against the whole saint thing, but leave him be. Yeah, so John Huss said, as we are commanded to obey our superiors in things lawful and honorable with the circumstances taken into consideration, so we are commanded to resist them to the face when they walk contrary to the divine counsels or commandments. And then Luther said, one of these two things has to happen. Either the word of God will abide and conquer them, or at least they will be unable to suppress it, even if they refuse to accept all its grace and goodness and salvation. Which is Luther's roundabout way of saying, yet yeah, the word of the Lord endures forever, which is the motto of the Reformation. Psalm 119, verse... 18-ish. It's in Psalm 119. It's not verse 118. That's a really long psalm. Psalm 119. I should know this off the top of my head. When I, I want to say 119, 18. There are a lot of verses in 119. No, that's not what... That's verse 1... The, the quote from verse from Psalm 119 is, I will speak of your testimonies before kings, O Lord, and will not be put to shame. Okay. And that is... Yeah, that's 31. I cling to your testimonies. Let them not... Let me not... Yeah, that's cool. But they talk about that, talk about that same theme. 48... It's in that it's somewhere in this part of Psalm 119. Yeah, but yeah, I will speak of your testimonies before kings, O Lord, and will not be point to shame. Forty-eight. Forty-eight. Forty-six. That was close. There was a four. Okay. Yeah, Psalm 119, verse 46. Uh, I will speak of your testimonies before kings, and shall not be put to shame. Uh, which is on the front title page of the first edition of the book of Concord when it got published. I believe. Um, anyway. So, in these kind of troubled times where we think the government is maybe telling us things that we shouldn't be listening to, at times, you know, it's, yeah, you're supposed to, we're supposed to listen, because you know, how very Lutheran with the two, two kingdoms, we have the kingdom of the left, the secular world, the kingdom of the right. And it's like, well, fourth commandment says we're supposed to obey our leaders unless they tell us something that's directly against the law of God. So if it's directly against the law of God, then we have to disobey. Um, but so many of the things today that we question, is it directly against the word of God? 
some of the stuff you really can't make that argument. So it's a, a choice of conscience. People want to use this verse as one of those verses to say, see, whenever you disagree with the government, this is what you know. It's not what it says. It says if it's against the law of God. So anyway, now they want to kill him. All right, so you have a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel. And Gamaliel, I believe it was is the house of Hillel, which is this great noble house of rabbis, this, this lineage of rabbis, really wise men whose writings uh, have been handed down. So we have Gamaliel. He's a teacher of the law held in honor by the people. So a teacher of the law, remember, is not a lawyer like we think of, but a teacher of the law is a doctor of the church. So just like a doctor of theology is a doctor of theology, a doctor of the law is a doctor of Jewish theology and the Jewish church back then. So he is a, a academician, a wise man, an academic of Judaism. Uh, so he's a rabbi of rabbis. He's the rabbi that the other rabbis learned from, like a professor. And so he said, okay, guy, take these guys out. We got to talk. And then he said, okay, well, here, here's the wise thing to do. Think about what you're going to do. Before these days, there's this fellow Thaddeus uh, rose up, uh, who we have a record outside the Bible. Josephus recorded his rebellion. Um, which is like, you know, not probably after this time, but uh, there is a, th let's try this again. Josephus records a rebellion by a, game, a guy named Thaddeus. Thutis, Thutis, Thutis. Uh, Josephus records a rebellion by this guy, which hasn't happened yet. That's years down the road. Uh, so Luke is probably talking about different guy. And I think, yeah, the study Bible has a note about that. Um, and it is possible that it is referred to also in Josephus. So Josephus wrote a book called Antiquities, uh, which is a great uh, history of the Jews. And in that book, he talks about many of these rebellions, which is how we know there are false messiahs running around. I've said that before. There were many false messiahs running around even when Jesus was around. And we have some of these guys' names recorded in external histories, uh, one of which being uh, Josephus, who the Romans paid to have him write. You know, they wanted, like, how do we manage these people? Well, let's get a guy to write a good history about them so we understand them. Uh, so the Jews didn't necessarily like Josephus so much. But, collaborator. Yeah, because no, anybody that worked with the Romans was a collaborator, exactly. Well, that's why the Herods were put in power. They're not Jews. Right? So that's why the Herods came to power, which is why the Jews hated them. The Romans hated them because the Romans hated everybody. <laughs> right? But they put, you know, they put the, the Heridian dynasty in place, these kings, in scare quotes, uh, because they weren't actually Jews. They were, what were they? I want to say they were Samaritan or something else. Don't quote me on that, but they were not Jews. Uh, so the Jewish people did not like that, but anyhow, so you had this guy rose up and he got a, got, a, got a bunch of followers and they killed him and all the followers went away. And then another guy named Judas rose up during the days of the census. Um, Josephus records that census as being around the year six uh, when... Uh, Quirinius became the censor, which is the guy who takes the census, uh, which is possibly talking about the same census we were talking about with Jesus. There's a lot of debate when that census was, what year was it. Uh, yeah, just briefly, since I said it, I'll explain it here in a second. But so anyway, this guy rose up, and when they got rid of him, all his followers went away. So it's like, hey, we killed Jesus. He's dead because they don't believe he rose from the dead. So Jesus is dead. Yeah, you got these guys, but that's going to go away. If it's not from God, it's just going to go away. Like every other time before, these things go away. So 
leave these guys alone. Because it's from man, nothing's going to come of it. But if it's from God, you, know, you might want to stop and think about what you're doing. Hedge your bets. Hedge your bets, right. So you might even be found like, what if, what if this is God? What if this was true? What if Jesus was the son of God? What are you going to do? Well, don't kill these guys because then you'd be opposing God. I mean, not that everything else they're doing isn't opposing God, but that was actually wise. Like, hey, if this is just a thing, it's going to go away. So they called in the apostles and they beat them, told them not to do that, don't do that anymore, and let them go. And they left the council, and they were ecstatic, right? Because, hey, this is what Jesus said was going to happen. You're going to confess my gospel. Men are going to hate you. They're going to try to kill you. And that's good. Okay, this is good. Jesus said this was going to happen. This is great. This is an honor. And so they just preached all the more, and the movement keeps moving. Didn't stop teaching. And next week, we'll talk more about some other fellows getting chosen to serve. We could do this chapter really quick. Let's do chapter. We'll, we'll do chapter. We'll do the first part of chapter six, and we'll start the story of Stephen next week because this is short. Uh, but that's really it. That means it's just history being reported for. So, oh, the census. So, when in '86, Corinna, Corinna, I keep wanting to say Cyrenius because that's how we learned it, right? From Luke 2 when we were kids. So it's Quirinius is the way it's spelled now in the ESV. Uh, he became imperial legate of Syria in 86. We have the census forms. And we know that that census was held every 14 years. So they had the Romans were excellent record keepers. Uh, so we, have, we actually have the records. We know that that census was every, so these dates and things. So was it the same census as the one when Jesus was born? Maybe, maybe not. It actually doesn't matter. But people want to use this argument. It's like, hey, here's this guy, Quirinius, and here's the census, and you said your guy was born in the year zero, and here is the year six. Well, what gives? Maybe not the same guy. Maybe not the same census. I mean, these names were common, very common names. I mean, it's just like, how many people are named John? How many people are named William, right? It's a very common name in our country. And then, you're like, how many people were named Julius in the Roman Empire? It was, like, most common first name ever. Everybody was named Julius. <coughs> or how many Jews were named Jesus? Lots. I mean, we, we transliterated Jesus out of the Greek, but it's in Hebrew, right? It's Yeshua. It's Joshua. It's one of the most common Jewish names ever, right? So... Not to mention how many fellows in South America are named Jesus. Because Jesus, right? It's a very common first name. You know, so these Roman names, they were not, they reused names like crazy. Uh, they had added other parts to their names to identify who they were. Kind of like, you know, how, how kind of like they do with Jews, they always say son of whoever, right? You know, to make sure it's like, oh yeah, Simon, you know, son of Jonah, because Simon. You know, son of Fred over here is a different guy. So you make sure you get the right guy. Uh, so, yeah, people that want to use the census dates to disprove the Bible are spinning their wheels. Uh, but don't listen to them. They have other records, and it's not a good argument. All right, Acts chapter 6. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, these same days, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Interesting little, little trivia Luke drops there. I like that. I like how Luke 
end sections with these little nuggets. So like a great many of the priests became obedient. So they're not just converting people, they're converting Jewish priests to the faith. Isn't that interesting? And this is the first time the word disciples is used. There's a Lutheran study Bible note on that. That's interesting. Okay, the Hellenists. Let's see, since they wrote an article about it, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel trying to explain it. Let's see. I lost my spot. 1556. Those were the Greek-speaking Jews, right? Mm -hmm. So you had the Hellenists. So the Hellenists were the Jews who accepted the Greek language and uh, a lot of Greek practice. And they were influenced by the, let's see, make sure I get this right. They are influenced by the Egyptians because the Egyptians or the rulers of the Egyptians weren't Egyptian. They were Greek. That's the Ptolemies, right? So you have the Ptolemies. So the Ptolemies influenced that culture, that part of Greek culture uh, and Hellenism. Hellenist, Hellenist just refers to the language, the Greek language. So you have a Hellenic Greek, you have Attic Greek. They're the two uppity, like snooty kinds of like uh, high society Greek in when Greece was an empire. Uh, you see these Hellenists that, that uh, were influenced heavily by the uh, Greek influence out of Egypt. And then you have a division that's gonna occur between the Jews. The Jews start fighting among themselves. So you have the Hellenist Greeks, and then you have the Seleucid Greeks who had were influenced by the Arab people, the other part of Asia Minor. So you have different part of Asia. So I believe the Seleucid kings came out of the Arab countries, right? And then you had, so you have a group influenced by those and you have a group influenced by the Greeks and they kind of start doing this eventually. That's outside the Bible. But you do have this, this split starting to take place. Uh, and so the Hellenists rose against the Hebrews. So the Hebrews are your Jewish Jews, your Jews in Jerusalem that are not influenced by culture. They're, all, they're culturally just Jews. Your Jews everywhere else are Greek Jews, right? You have the Greek Jews over here influenced, and then you have the, the Jews over here influenced by the Arab uh, countries. Uh, so here we have the Hellenists butting heads with the, the Jerusalem Jews. Uh, because the widows were being neglected, and that was a very big deal in Judaism, right? You always, there's, there's stuff in the Talmud, stuff in the in Torah about making sure you take care of widows and children. You know, and there was rules if a woman's, you know, if a woman's husband died and she didn't have a child or brother had to be with her to produce heirs for him. You know, if he dies and he didn't have children, brother has to step in and have his wife bear his sons so that that line can continue. There's all these rules about that, making sure widows are taken care of because a widow with no children is going to die. She has no way to take care of herself, right? That was the big deal when uh, Jesus came out to uh, the woman whose son died, right? And how uh, he stopped and you know raised her because you know her husband told us her husband had died and now her son has died, and so like this woman is going to die. There's no one to take care of her. There's no male in the family, so you got to take care of widows. So the, so something's happening. Nobody's visiting the nobody's visiting the shut-ins. They were being neglected in the daily distribution. Uh, so the apostles gathered the full number of disciples and said, well, we've got to do this. You know, we need to, 
we need to do church, we need to teach, we need to stand here, we need to make more pastors. We shouldn't stop doing this to go do this stuff because they will never do this stuff. We're not baptizing and teaching if we're just doing house visits. So we're going to teach you guys how to do it, right? So they'd be like, okay, let's pick our best guys, and now let's lay on hands, and they will go do that. So you see the first church council taking place, and you see guys like church, like our church council. You see the first church council get together, and they say, well, you guys go do this. Well, but also uh, those seven men that were chosen, Mm -hmm. they, they were specifically... Uh, Greek, because, I I read that somewhere in here, Uh, the early church, the the church elected them and ordained them, and they were appointed, and they chose these men because they had Greek names. The murmuring had come from the Greek-speaking segment of the church. Mm -hmm that the widows were being right, elected. Right. So those elected to care for the work of the widows came from their, you know, the widows. Right. Uh, yeah, and if you look at that, they do indeed, although only one was specifically mentioned of where he's from, Antioch. But yes, all those names are Greek. Um, yeah, my name That's a re- comes from Greek. That means crown. <coughs> See, Philip, I don't know what that means. I actually don't know what most of these names mean, but yeah, they're all Greek names. Yeah, that's interesting, though, isn't it? So it's like, okay, these guys are falling down on the job, so these guys are going to go take care of it because they notice. You, you got, it's well, like taking care of your own. Right. It was the Greek segment that was complaining, so let's send Greek origin yeah. Yeah. nationality to go take care of it. Right. So are these... Are these so when it says the Hebrews, are they actually talking about are they talking about Jews? Or are they talking about converts to Christianity? Because it makes it sound like because the Hebrews, those are Jerusalem Jews. And they speak Aramaic, they don't speak Greek. But are they and the Hellenists? They're, you know, the Greek influenced Jews, but are these Jews or are these Christians? That's my question. Does it matter? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. They're Christians. They're Christians. Yeah, they're Christians. So it's interesting that they're calling these, so we have groups of Christians, but they're already kind of separate because you have all the converts in Jerusalem from Pentecost. Now you have all these converts up here, the Greek speakers. Um, So you just have kind of factions, but they're Christians. Because why else would the apostles be involved? But yeah, they're they're, they're Jewish converts. So you have Jewish converts and they're going to, well, hey, there's a group of us that's being ignored, so okay, well, yeah, we should take care of that. So they made sure they had Jewish, the guys from their own faction, the Greek speakers, and they said, okay, you guys go up there and take care of this. Missionaries almost, not missionaries, but... Lay people. Lay people, yeah, lay people. Lay people, it sounds that way, doesn't it? And, and, we, and I mean, that's where we get our words like, like elder, deacon, presbyter. Well, they were a step up from the lay people. They're pastors. They're pastors. They're not just... Yeah. I really want to look at what the Greek says. But the, the laying on of hands is the, is the telling. As they, these they set before the apostles. They prayed. They laid their hands on them and said, go. You know, they might just be doing visitations. They might just be distributing the sacrament. But they're pastors. I would have to say they are pastors at this point. Um, because that is how Why we... Why do they keep using the word deacons? Because deacon is another word for pastor. Now okay. we've adopted those words from Greek. You. Okay, so like some churches have elders. 
like our church, we have deacons, and they are people who assist the pastor, but they're not pastors. In the New Testament, when you say deacon, elder, presbyter, those are pastors. They are not just helpers. Those are pastor words, all of them. Um, but we have adopted those words to mean those who assist the, the pastor who are not necessarily ordained. Um, in the Catholic Church, deacons are ordained. They are not yet priests. It's one of those steps. Uh, but they use they do use the term biblically. So they're maybe not full on like preaching pastors, but they are. Uh, and even the same as these deacons in here in the New Testament, they might not be full on word and sacrament pastors, but they're on the way. They, they're starting to delegate jobs. But these are the laying on the hands. That is ordination. That's consecration, which we saw when we studied Hebrews how they did that with the priests, and they've continued that practice. Did they anoint with oil at that time? Um, I didn't get anointed well, but I don't know. It didn't say. I think it just said they laid their hands on them. But yeah, because the anointing with oil, I mean, that, yeah, was consecration of, of priests, but also kings. Uh, so maybe they stopped that practice because of that. I don't know. I'm speculating. Uh, but so anyway, yep, they send these guys. They laid hands on them. They are pastors or pastors in training, vicars even, if you want to use that term. Um, and they sent them on to do these jobs. Serving tables is the Lord's Supper also. So, um, yeah, and unfortunately, vicars sometimes have to consecrate the Lord's Supper if you have no alternative or no pastor available. We're not really supposed to do that, but we do. We're given permission to do it, just like the apostles here gave these guys permission. You guys need to go do this. And as we get more guys, more pastors, they'll take care of it. But that's what that's all about. It's like, okay, the, the apostles, they're the, they're the professors at the seminary, right? So they like, can't just abandon the seminary to go here and there and there. That's what guys like Paul are going to be for, right? And that's eventually what Peter's going to go do too. Peter's going to go on his uh, missionary journeys. So they said, okay, got to find guys, the right guys, good guys. We're going to lay hands on them, and they're going to go forth. Full of the Spirit and wisdom also is another uh, phrase that tells you that these guys are, are pastors. Uh, because they've been there, they've been with the apostles, they've been getting trained. Because clearly they've seen a need for that. Look at, look at the growth they're having. It's like, okay, they can't just all hang out around the 12 and expect it to go if it's going to spread. All these places are going to need pastors. All these people that were at Pentecost and heard the gospel and went back home and started house churches, they're going to need pastors too. So that's all, it's all starting. That's where we'll stop this week. Next week we'll pick up with verse uh, chapter 6, verse 8, and tell Stephen's story. And we'll see, that's a long passage also. And then we get introduced to Paul in his former life. And Philip. And the sorcerer. There's lots of good stories in this. So we get to see the sorcerer, the magician.